Hello everybody, good evening and welcome to your very own Baiju's 9th and 10th grade channel. I'm your teacher Aishwarya and in our class today, we are going to be discussing the chapter Globalization and the Indian Economy and we will discuss the entire chapter at one shot. So I hope that all of you are super duper excited for this class and if you are, please do let me know if my audio, my video and my screen and whatever I'm writing on the screen is visible to all of you. If it is, give me a quick thumbs up to let me know that we are good to go. So I can see Ayushman, Anamika, Michelle, Akriti, Frosty. What, what an interesting name. I can see many of you are here. And I can see Ankit is here. Good evening, Sakshi, uh, Mohammad, Vipin. Yes, of course. Good evening, all of you. Good evening. Now, as I can see, many of you are here and I'm pretty sure many of you might be watching this video much after the live stream, which is why I'm not going to take too much of your time, I'm going to quickly make sure that we jump right into it, right? So as you all know, in our class today, we are going to be covering the chapter Globalization and the Indian Economy, which is the last chapter in economics and we'll be done with all the economic sessions. Now, one very important update is that for those of my live students who are watching with me right now, tomorrow at 7 o'clock, we will also be doing a PYQ session for economics. Now that on the channel, at least our syllabus is complete. So tomorrow, 7 p.m., we will be having a PYQ session specifically for all the economics chapters, right? Now, of course, when you are attending this class, very important thing that I'd like all of you to keep in mind is that have your notebook and your textbook ready. Please make sure you have your stationery ready, which means pen, pencil and all of that your water bottles right have your water bottles ready and have a quiet place to sit and focus now this right here is going to be very important for all of you because today i hope that this chapter is a pretty simple chapter see this chapter is very simple it's very easy it's not too complicated so i'm assuming i'm going to be taking about one and a half hours today to wind up this chapter now what can you expect in this particular class let me tell you that in today's class, I will of course be doing the complete chapter explanation, right? So I will do the complete chapter explanation where we will look at all the important topics. Now side by side, as you all know, I do a NCRT corner. Now for those of you who are watching new and for the first time you are watching this class, what is an NCRT corner? An NCRT corner is where I will be reading the NCRT textbook and I'll make you underline all the important points that you need for your board exams, which means having your textbook is super important. Now, next up, what do we need to do? We will also be covering some important questions. So I will be giving you poll questions. Now, sadly, today, because of my health, I was not able to add questions on the slide. So I will be giving you, vocally, I will be writing the question on the screen. And then, of course, you know, we will be sort of solving them together. And I will be making the polls live, right? Now, last but not the least, at the end, I will be giving you some subjective questions for practice. So now, of course, many of us struggle to understand what kind of questions will come. So we will be doing subjective questions also. Now, very important thing which I think is necessary for us is that sometimes after a session is done, we don't know how much we've actually learned from the session. So if you look at the description of this video, there is a Google form link that is there right on top. Now, if you click on that Google form, you will get about five questions. Now, I would recommend that you solve the Google form only after the live stream or after you watch this video because it will tell you how much you have understood from this particular chapter or from this particular explanation and as you all know there are only going to be five questions easy peasy questions so we can get right to it right now Whippin and many others are asking me can we make notes from the session definitely you can make boards from this particular session now off late I have realized that many students have a confusion on what is the syllabus for this chapter see Jishna many others are asking me ma'am syllabus me kya hai in this chapter, what exactly is going to come? What should we follow? How many of you are pretty confused about this? Yes? Okay. Now I can see Sid, Nana, many of you are asking me this, right? 
Chinnari Creations, Tarana Ma'am is with us, right? She will be joining us, right? But off, off late, of course, she's been caught up with other things that she's not taking classes regularly, but she is with us. Ma'am, me, I know. I know for a fact because many of you when we were solving practice papers, you know, or when we were solving other kind of papers, I have realized that you guys are not pretty sure, which is why I have the syllabus on the screen. Now, this is the official CBSE syllabus 2023-24 for the chapter globalization and the Indian economy. See, what all do we need to know? Now, full and final, we have gone into it. What is globalization? What are the factors that have enabled globalization? Now, in this particular case, you need to have an understanding of what is globalization, its definition, its impact, right? Details, who are the drivers of globalization, right? Mainly your MNCs, what they do, so on and so forth. And examine the significance of G20. This G20 topic is something that is not there in your textbook, but something that you need to read up on because maybe they can ask you case-based questions, right? Which is why, see, understanding what is globalization, drivers of globalization, right? Role of MNCs on a brief basis, you need to go about it and we are good to go, right? We are all good to go. G G20 is an additional topic. Impact of globalization is not really there, right? We don't have impact of globalization. Positive, negative impact, although it's there in rationalized syllabus, it is not per se there. Now, today I will touch base a little bit on the details of MNCs because later when you look at when you learn globalization and then, you know, they briefly mention MNCs, it could be slightly tricky for us to understand, which is why I'll go a little bit into the details of the MNC bit, which is there in the beginning of the chapter, but we will go through it, right? And students, there's a lot of, um, what do you say? There is a lot of confusion regarding this, which is why I'm going to touch base on all of this today. Let me tell you this G20 topic I will cover today as well. So are we all ready? Good evening, Aditya. Good evening. Yes. Yes, ma'am. What kind of questions in G20? We will cover all of that. Not to worry at all. Right. Now, main focus you need to have a look at is on questions related to your globalization and all of that. You got to learn when teachers say maybe. Yeah, I know. But today is going to be a very easy class. Right. I'm telling you this chapter is very simple and easy. Okay. Ma'am, I'm sorry. Actually, Ayushman, I did check out the question. It's just that I didn't get time to reply back to you. But let me tell you, that is out of syllabus. I wanted to reply you with the answer as well, but that is out of syllabus. They will not ask you. Reference books like Lakhmir Singh have that content, but your board exam paper is going to be set as per your NCRT textbook, which means if you're CBSC, if you're a CBSC board student, those questions are not going to come. I just didn't get time to reply back, but I will reply back to you on the comment as well. Okay. Cool. Why is my voice weird? I'm still struggling, bacha. I'm still struggling with my voice and sore throat. TK guys, let's jump right into it. And I'm going to start with a very simple concept, right? Can you give me some examples of popular smartphones that we use, right? Can you all tell me what kind of phone, if let's say if you don't own a phone right now, what kind of phone does maybe your parents own? Because right now in every household, there is going to be a smartphone which is going to be there for sure yes don't give me just give me brand names i don't want to know the specific models but yes most often you'll all tell me ha huh, ma'am apple samsung you'll tell me um yeah um apple iphone okay all one oppo redmi vivo yes i can see all of you giving me answers amazing yes i know mi all of that nokia I have a pixel, right? So Google is also part of the fold. Yes, exactly. So these are all what do you say, Apple, Samsung, OnePlus. Now my question to you is, these phones that you all use, you are all, it is all available in India. But did it originate from India? Yes or no? Do we find companies like Apple, Samsung, OnePlus, all of these phones originating from the country? Is it originating from the country? That means that it started off building from this country. 
No, right? We see that if you look at the headquarters or the base of these phones, they are all located in different countries. But for some reason, you and I sitting in India are able to access whether it be iPhone, whether it be, you know, like a Samsung S, Z Fold or let's say even Nokia or let's have a look at OnePlus phones, right? Some of them, yes, they originate. But the examples I have taken, let's say like Samsung and Apple, they are not from our country, yes? But on the other hand, even if you take another day-to-day -day example of fast food brands. Now today, after this class, you're like, Arey ma'am, bohat stress ho gaya. Abhi, you know, we've been studying so much. Abhi, khane ka man kar raha hai. I feel like having pizza or maybe burger. And if you want to have something like that, where will you go? You want to have pizzas or burgers? I mean, right now, I will tell you an interesting fact about it. You will tell me, ha ma'am, I'll order from Domino's. I'll get, you know, that offer where for 49 rupees, I will get 4-4 four, four pizzas. Is it still 49? I don't know. But ah, uh, Domino's is our go-to pizza, right? If we want to have 4 pizzas, our arm say, we will order Domino's. We will use maybe some food delivery apps like how Swastika is suggesting. You will go to McDonald's, yes, or maybe you might go to Burger King. There are all new, new things like Popeyes, Wendy's and everything that's coming. Hi, if Domino's is not available, we see that combo meal and all that we can buy. Now, interestingly, we see that although we have Domino's and everything which initially brought in the trend of fast foods and all that to our country. See, our country... In an Indian household, if you look at snacks, right? What are the kind of snacks that we naturally make at home? It could maybe have some pakoras, maybe some bhajis, right? And a lot of chaat, right? All those things have what have originated within our country. But now the influx of fast food, which is something that we see in the Western countries, has come into our country. So in all these cases, what do we see? We are the people who are consuming all of this, right? We are the people who are consuming all of this. And over a period of time, any place you go, you go to any street, especially in the urban areas, if you look at cities, right? We see that there is so much of choice for us. Today, if you want to order a burger, let me tell you the bhaiya, there will be one Ganesh food stall. Ganesh food stall will also give me burger. Fresh therapy will also give me burger. We see that, you know, um, McDonald's will also give me burger. So if you look at it, we see that there are so many places, right? So many places from which I can get any kind of food that I want. So in this particular case, what do we see? We see that our options have increased over a period of time. See, today if you want to study, let me give you an even more basic example. Today, if you want to study globalization and Indian economy, you don't find one teacher teaching you. You also have so many options where you are able to learn from so many of us, right? <coughs> Sorry about that. So in this particular case, what do we see? We see that over a period of time, we see that our markets have been transformed, right? So when I say our markets have been transformed, it means that there has been a variety of goods which is available in the Indian market. And as a result, what do you see? More options for us as consumers. So how did this happen? What brought about this change? And how it has changed our life, right? So this phenomenon is what we call as globalization. So globalization is basically the rapid integration or interconnection between countries through foreign trade and foreign investment, right? So here, as you all know, rapid integration and interconnection between countries how are these countries or how is this happening? It is happening through foreign trade and it is happening through foreign investments. So now have we understood what is globalization, right? We've understood the basic lesson of what is globalization. Now globalization is not something which is happening in the past 10 years, 15 years when smartphones and fast foods and all of that came in. But rather we see that globalization was something which happened way in the past also. So if you look at your history lessons, right, and you look at the chapter nationalism in India, why did the East India Company come into our country in the first place? Now I have a question for all of you where I'll check your history. How much do you remember from your um, 
How much do you remember from nationalism in India? Yes. Why did the East India Company come into our country in the first place? Can you all tell me that? To do trading, right? What is trade? Trade is basically where you buy and sell, right? So, wherein you buy and sell. So, for trading purpose, the East India Company came into our country. And as a matter of fact, even if you go way back in history, many people before they started, you know, especially back when monarchy was there, where we had a lot of kings, right? We saw that most often, if let's say one king wanted to conquer another land, that would be because of the kind of raw materials that was found, probably because they had something that was of value, which if they owned, they were able to export and make more money. So traveling as traders, conquerors, and even through migration, right? This happened way back then only, yes? And eventually, when of course, you know, we were colonized, even colonized countries ended up trading or selling out raw materials, right? So there was a lot of export of say raw materials, food materials and let's say even finished goods. Yes. So this was this trading was one way in which we were able to connect or we were different parts of the world was getting connected. Right. So that's when globalization started in the first place. Now, of course, this was way back then. But let's say in the 20th century, there was a game changer altogether, right? So in the 20th century, what do we observe? There was a game changer altogether. And who was this game changer? Who was this game changer that brought about different parts of the country together? Ankit, I will give me the, I'll give you that answer after the class. But now you are going to pay attention to me, right? Yes. Ma'am, it was USA. Okay, I'm looking for something different. You are telling me country, but we are asking who was a game changer, right? Very good, Jishna. Very good, Sakshi, Akriti. Technology, yes, but who brought in that, right? Uh, yes, um, Ak Akin Janarti, I will tell Ankita ma'am, she's going to come up with that very soon. See, they are your MNCs, right? So, there were companies called as multinational companies. See, now, of course, it's not that we were just still, still doing import-export. There were companies which were based off it. But later, what happened? They realized that, of course, with advent of technology, there was also setting up companies like the multinational companies that were there, which were able to not just restrict their economic activities within a certain country, but they were also able to connect different parts of the world together. So what is a multinational company? Now a multinational company is the one that owns or controls production in one or more countries, right? So here we see that they own or they control the production in more than one country. So we see that they either produce or they sell goods and services to different parts of the country, right? So are we all clear? I will explain what is foreign trade and foreign investment. Don't worry, right? Yes. So we see that we own and control the production in more than one country. And we see that we are able to sort of expand. Yeah, we, we're kind of far away from that, Aishman, but yes, we are expanding, right? Okay, now I'll quickly do the NCRT reading for this part. Now, often we will tend to skip the initial bit of it because we feel like, ma'am, this is not part of it, right? This is not needed for us to write answers. But let me tell you that that's not the case, right? That is not the case. This particular thing is very, very important. So let's go through this once again. And Chinari, to answer your question, yes. Think of Apple. Apple has various, see, Apple gets its raw materials from one place. Assembly is done. Assembly is done in India itself. Showrooms are open in different places. We see that there are uh, centers where there are work happens. So yes, it is, right? So quickly to go through the initial part of the textbook, please don't ignore because they can ask you questions, right? So here, what do we see? 
in a matter of fact we see that our markets have been transformed why because we see that over a period of time in today's world we have a wide choice of goods and services right and along with that we see that over a period of time every season right every season newer versions or newer models are available thereby we see that advanced improved models means that we will have more choices better choices to be exposed Look at iPhone itself. Every year you have a new iPhone coming in and you feel like the new iPhone is better than the previous one. So consumers migrate towards the new one, right? Similarly, what happens? A similar explosion of brands, right? So this becomes the fact that people want to consume more and more. So eventually a wide range of choice of goods in our market is a relatively recent phenomena which has transformed our market, right? Now, of course, in the, this initial paragraph here talks about the advent, right? So this right here talks a little bit about the advent of globalization, how globalization started and how earlier colonized countries were affected. Now, how over a period of time, MNCs were impacted. Now, here I would like to take up a topic on how spreading of production has happened. So, how is it that MNCs are able to set up offices or own and control production in different parts? So, that's where this example comes into the picture. Wherein, let's assume that there's a large MNC. Let's call this Global X. So, Global X is an MNC which is owned by me, right? And we see that in this particular case, Global X is responsible for producing industrial equipment, design, so on and so forth. Now, if you look at it, the research bit of it is happening in the United States. Now, because I'm dealing with industrial equipment like big, big machines, I need to manufacture them. So, we see that manufacturing is happening in China. Then, after it's manufactured in China, we see that it is getting shipped to Mexico and Eastern Europe and finally the finished products are sold all over. Now of course we see that after this we also require customer care, customer services and all these services need to be provided which means that we need more people to be employed in the service sector. Yes, which is why we see that in India we see that the service sector car headquarters is located. So thereby, if you see what happens, we see that different parts of the world are connected. Exactly. Look at it. Now I'm giving you a hypothetical example of Global X. But various MNCs function in this aspect. That's why if you look at various MNCs, see, most popular example could be that of Infosys. They have multiple projects which are running all across the world. Which is why sometimes people from India will be sent, let's say, to Australia for a project where they will collaborate with so many other people there. And the final outcome of that project might probably be implemented in the United States. So that's how globalization is brought about. So in this case, what do we observe? We see that in this particular case, MNCs make it complex, right? We see that their production is very organized, but the organization is very complex. It's not a straightforward thing. You make, you buy, you sell. No, it is highly complex for this particular case so that it can be spread across the globe, right? Okay, exactly. See, even if it is an Indian based one, it could be manufactured in a different part of the region, right? Now, this is an example that they have given. Now, whatever examples are given in your textbook, please don't ignore it. Now, see, Abhi, looking at the CBSE practice paper, looking at the CBSE sample paper and everything, I would always say that, please, please go through the case that is given, right? So, whatever ye wala text boxes that you see in globalization, read it. Don't memorize it, but just read it once before the exam, right? Arjun, due to my health, I was not able to take both classes, which is why I was had to pick this class, but I will take climate also very soon. I'm really sorry. It's just that I'm still recovering, so I hope you don't mind, but the chapter will come very soon, right? Okay. So now we are clear. Now, I'm going to go a little bit into how MNCs function also. I'm going to touch base on this topic as well. We're going to quickly cover this topic so that we get a good idea, right? I'm not going to sit and spend too much time on this topic, but I will touch base on some of the important topics here. Yes, PYQ session will happen tomorrow, right? Now, how do MNCs function? 
Now we've understood what is a multinational company, right? So MNCs, what they do is they locate their operations on different, different parts of the world. Now, why are they doing that? Why can't if I'm a company based out of UX, right? The, I mean, US, UX it seems. So if I am Global X, which is based out of the United States of America, why can't I just produce all my things in America only? Why am I breaking my head, sending something to China, sending something to India, sending something else to Mexico? What is the need? I can just do it within my own country, right? Why is it that we need to spend why are we going through this highly complex process? Reason being is the cost of production. See, tomorrow, when you want to be a businessman, right? You want to be a businessman or you want to be a businesswoman. What do you want to do? What is your end goal? Are ma'am, if I want to be a businesswoman, my end goal should be ki I make profit, right? You want to make profit? Only then tomorrow all of you are going to be, you know, you'll be like, oh, I did business, now I'm able to make money and thereby I'm able to self-sustain. That is the reason, right? That is, if there is a business, the intent is to not just deliver quality. See, you want to make profit, but how will you make profit? Profit needs to happen with good quality also. But then quality comes in two ways, right? One is you can get, get cheap labor. You reduce, you use, for example, if I spend, let's assume I spend, let's say 10,000 rupees, right? In order to manufacture, assemble, let's say an industrial equipment like a Xerox machine. I spend 10,000 rupees. But now if I sell this for, let's say 12,000 rupees, right? I am making a profit of this. Now at the same time, imagine if I could be more efficient and I sell it only, I make it for 6,000 rupees, but I am selling for 12,000 rupees. Then I'm making double the profit, right? So in the case of MNCs, they base it out in different regions so that they can reduce their cost of production. See, 10,000 rupees may it is making, you are able to make it. But if in India, I'm able to get it only in 6,000 rupees, that is a profit for me, right? So thereby what happens? MNCs will focus on increasing their profit. And thereby we see that it is not just limited to selling their goods, but they also produce them globally, right? Very, very important. Now, how do they decide? Where will I manufacture? Where will it be, uh, you know, where will I manufacture this? Where will I sell this? Where will I assemble? Who will be my service? So all of that depends upon some various factors, right? So first of all is availability of labor. Now availability of labor depends upon how many skilled labors I will get and how many unskilled. Now unskilled labors will be mainly used, let's say for running factories and all of that. Skilled labor is necessary for research, customer service, so on and so forth, right? So we see that I need a place where I can get both but at a very low cost, right? I don't want to spend too much money, but I want to get both of it, yes? Now, at the same time, wherever I use my production unit. So let's say Apple has opened up a manufacturing unit or let's say you take a simple one like Tata, right? Tata Motors has opened up a manufacturing unit in India. Now, of course, it's based in India, but let's assume it's there in India. Now, what is the reason? We see that Many people buy Tata car cars, right? Tata Indica is one of the most common Uber cars you find, yes? So you see demand, it's, it's closer to where people will buy your product, where we see that the amount of people purchasing it is more, right? So we see that that is how they decide upon how they choose. That's why choosing of market is very important. Similarly, we see that availability of other factors, like if there is land to set up factory, if they have material, is raw material available, and along with that, government policies also. Not that any country will come in. Global X from US, I have decided, oh, I'll open in India. Or I'm say I will fly one day to India and open up a, you know, new factory. Not happening. I need to abide by the laws of the government. I need to make it a point that I am friendly. It's a, you know, environmental friendly business. All of that matters, right? Okay. Uh, King Bacha, if you are not paying attention because you are talking about Battlestar, it will be difficult. Maybe you are watching it from the beginning. Maybe you started from the mid, requesting you to go back and watch it from the beginning, right? Yes, Ankita, I'm going to come to that. Just give me two minutes. So thereby, right? 
we saw that globalization is interconnectedness and inter what do you say rapid flow of let's say across different countries through foreign investment what is this foreign investment now have you all understood yes foreign investment is when this multinational company is going to invest money in a foreign country so now i am global x right i am global x and i have decided to invest money in india where in or let's say let's not take india i want to invest in indonesia because let's give new, newer examples right so in this case what do you see i am investing in indonesia i am investing some money but i am not from indonesia right which is why we see that this right here is a foreign investment which is brought by me which is a mnc are we clear what is globalization we know globalization is the interconnectedness and the rapid flow across different countries through global trade i mean foreign trade and foreign investment now <coughs> In this case, what do we see? We see that investment is spending money, right? Investment is that I give a person money. Okay, you, I feel like I will give you maybe let's say one lakh rupees, and I know you'll be able to grow my business, right? So I am giving money in anticipation, in hope that they will earn profit in the future. And because I am not based off Indonesia, I am coming from the United Nations, United States of America. So I am a foreign country. but i am investing in another me being outside indonesia i am investing in indonesia which means that an mnc is what brings in a foreign investment right so this is what we need to have an idea about questions for physics in physics class right now how do they expand their business we're going to again quickly go through it in very simple words right in very very simple words we're going to understand how they expand now one is i invest money but how do i grow my profit so that i can go more and more profit i will make when my business grows bigger and bigger if i have global x which is only one outlet right you imagine global x sells industrial equipment but i have only one store okay small one right where only few opportunities will be there but if i go to more same thing if i open many 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 more stores what will happen then i see that i will have business from store 1 store 2 store 3 store 4 store 5 so why do we see we see that I, why do we need this thereby i am able to grow more profit right from six stores i am able to make money right okay now i'm going to stop right now to take a question which ashwini is asking me ma'am why do companies need investment now ashwini there are two reasons now let's assume i have let's take a simpler example Now let's assume that this is Aishu's Bakery, right? Aishu's Bakery is a bakery which is going to be open, which has an outlet, right? This has an outlet, let's say in MG Road in Bangalore. Only one store is there, MG Road in Bangalore. Now what happens here? I see that every day I am getting, let's say, minimum. Hundred customers, right? I need hundred customers who are coming in, which means what? I need to have enough raw materials, right, to make all of it. I need to have people employed in my bakery, yes, so that they they are working for me. Now, in some cases, what will happen? I will also require cutlery, right? I need um, furniture so that people can sit in my bakery. Yes, I require a lot of things to set that bakery up in the first place. now i might not have that money i may not have so much money to do all of this but if i go to somebody who has a money who has that money right a investor right how many of you watch shark tank right shark tank has a very similar concept so you go to an investor who has that paisa with them they have money then i'll go and tell see i am getting 100 customers i am able to get a, on a daily basis i am making a revenue of 1 lakh rupees you give me little more money uh, what i will do i will open three more outlets i will make so much so much more money so thereby what will happen thereby i will say that i will get so much profit and from this profit i will give you one share so if i make profit of 10 lakh rupees i will give you this much 
share of that profit right so an investment is an initial money right it's it's the money that somebody gives you so that you can kick start the business right okay ma'am make rupee symbol sorry in one hurry i did dollar symbol but rupee right theek hai sachin i think have you joined right now did you join right now ma'am so why to take foreign investment when we can take investment for our country also you understand that when we get foreign investments right one of the many reasons why mncs or foreign investments are preferred is because one thing is that they are able firstly they may be able to invest more money see there is a certain amount of capital that will be there from our country right but from in our country also there is a lot of expenditure right but if you get foreign investment that initial pool of money let's assume india has this much money now in this how much only can they give to the others but if you bring in from outside then you are generating more employment opportunities you are uh, generating more um, you know more options for the consumer which is why we see that in this particular case we see that foreign investments are entertained in order for the overall growth right that is the intent okay ma'am is it necessary investor is a founder or owner no not always there's only so much a founder can invest in his own company he'll always need some external one right ma'am i have a comp uh, okay ma'am samaj me aa gaya Oh okay. Oh thank you Sachin. Awesome. Ma'am I have a company I require money to expand. Then can I launch ha ha but for IPO baba you guys are jumping to IPO are but for IPO there are a lot of steps. Not like today you launch company tomorrow you will get into the stock market and you have an IPO. No no. There are many things but we'll not go too much into the details of it okay. But no you can't do that in one you can't just directly get into an IPO you need to show that uh, your company is getting this much in revenue for consistently these many years there are many parameters for an ipo right okay so now coming back we have all become business minded decided to start our own startups but now let's have a look right now in this particular case right we see that strategies to expand business how does an mnc decide to expand the business ha asgar after telling all ramayan now you are asking me who's rama see foreign investment what is foreign investment take a screenshot of this slide when a multinational company invests money in a foreign country when it, to in order to do what in order to expand its business we call it as a foreign investment are we clear students take a screenshot this is very very important okay now let's get ashwini i'll take your question after i finish this small topic see this and all this is a little bit of gray area in our uh, syllabus which is why nonetheless i am going to teach you this part might as well you may not get questions but it's important for you to have an understanding of it which is why i am quickly going through these topics i am not spending too too much time right theek hai now coming back how will it expand their business they can expand their business one in two three ways one they can collaborate with a local company so normally if you look at big big companies like you know coca cola pepsi even water manufacturing companies let let me give you a very personal example my friend's father works for a small uh, what do you say manufacturing company right he owns that company and what do they do it is a local company which is based on bangalore you wouldn't have even heard their manufacturing name but what do they do they have investments coming from say big big water companies right water bottle manufacturing companies and what they do is they do it at a small they what they do is they manufacture it on their behalf right so let's assume that this is called let's say agarwal's bottles right this manufacturing company is called as agarwal's bottles or agarwal's manufacturing company they might take quota from the big mineral water companies and they will manufacture it for them so they will collaborate that means they are being friends right that means you're like hey you do this project for me it's kind of like that now in turn it's not like they will do it for free they will of course get some money out of it right so that is what we mean as collaborate or else they will establish a subsidiary right what is a subsidiary a subsidiary that is there could be basically a company a smaller company which is owned by a bigger one 
So if you look at the example of Disney, right? Disney Hotstar, it is a subsidiary company of Walt Disney in, 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 in itself, right? Which is a parent company. So what is parent, right? So in the case of parent company, we see that there will be smaller ones which are called as subsidiary. So MNCs can have a tie up with smaller units or else what they will do, they will buy the company only. If they have so much money, they will buy it. So the example that is given in your textbook is that of Cargill Foods, right? So this is of Cargill Foods that is there which has bought a smaller uh, Indian company which is a Parak Foods, right? So thereby what has happened by buying this local company, they are able to expand more, right? They are able to expand more or easily into the local markets, yes? Ma'am, do they act as outlets? No, outlets are different. Here we are speaking, Jishna, specifically to manufacturing. Outlets are completely different, which comes into the service bit of it where they can buy, right? Yes, ma'am, uh, for last year, yeah, yeah, the template is the same. But my teaching is obviously better than last year. I always tell you every year my teaching gets better and better. So every batch, it's like I watch my videos and I realize, oh, I could have taught this better. Ma'am, would MNC be formed even when large stakeholding companies buy little ones which have become franchises or branches over the region? Then also, no, right? See, what qualifies as a MNC? It needs to have production, assembly, and it needs to have that much revenue also. See, in our country, we have so many big, big companies, right? But if you look at MNCs, you will still say it's Infosys, TCS. You are restricted to a large, big, the big, big ones that are there. That's because it's over a period of time how, how, how well you have established even in your foreign countries. That is important. Ma'am, why foreign investors believe we will have profit? Yes, exactly, Ashwini. We can face loss also, right? If at all we face, there is a one side that you will get pros profit. That is why they never say that it is on the hope that you get profit. They say that it is on the anticipation that you will make profit. But there are chances for loss also, right? Ma'am, they establish different stores, call centers, exactly who, yes? Okay. Gurlal, see, bacha, we are doing testing for that, right? Uh, what's happening is, what if I launch a PDF platform for all of you, but it doesn't work? Then you'll come back and say, ma'am, you are very horrible. You gave us a very bad platform. So we are trying to, we are just making sure that the platform works effectively in all aspects. Whether you use a phone, whether you use tablet, whether you use whatever device, in every device it should be compatible. So we are just, do, you know, fixing some nuances there, right? We are just fixing out some nuances. TK. Now others um, who are not able to watch the session in continuity, you can watch it after, right? You can watch it after the live stream so that I think network issue is not there, right? Okay. Ma'am, will they... No, they won't do that. That's only in movies, Ashwini, where they come with dons and gundas. But in real life, that does not happen. But the implications are different. There will be implications, right? Ashok, come back and watch it. TK. Now, last one is a very important one is that Either they will buy the company or they will outsource it. Now, I'm not going to take names of brands, okay? Because it will be controversial if I take. But if you see, there are certain high-end garment brands. There are high-end garment brands which have been under the radar of, let's say, the ministry and just in general, right? Of, let's say, the garment and all of that. Where if you buy clothes of these brands, People say that it's not very advisable because these garment brands, they outsource their production. That means if let's say I am a garment brand, I can't even come up with anything. Okay, let's call it um, A Square brand, right? So my garment brand is called as A Square. Yes, it is called as A Square. Now what I will do? I am from a country which does not have any cotton. It does not have silk, nothing it has. So what I will do? I will outsource where I get my garments from. So I will make sure that in smaller countries, there will be these small scale producers, right? I say chotu chotu manufacturing countries that are there, right? So in this case, what do we see? We see that in smaller producers, what I'll do, I will tie up with them. 
and I will make it a point that in such cases, I will make them produce what I require, right? So they will manufacture for me and then I will sell it to everybody telling that this particular shirt is, you know, of a square brand. Right? So here I am not doing anything but rather I am giving the money and of course we see that I am outsourcing all my job. Whether it's getting raw material, whether it's getting service, whether it is to get the products, whatever it be, whether it is half made or full made, some cases you outsource it. Now this looks like a very fancy way, right? So to give you an example, Nike. You, we all know Nike. If you watch basketball, if you watch, because normally basketball may a lot of people, a lot of basketball players wear in the NBA. They wear Nike shoes, right? And why do I know this? I know this because um, my brother is a basketball player, right? So in this particular case, in the case of Nike, which is a US based company, right? We see that it manufactures across 38 different countries. And it has about 467 factories, roughly employing about 11 lakh workers, right? So in this particular case, what do you see? We see that it is expanding across different cases. Now in most places, of course, we see that in popular brands, very high-end brands also, we see that all everything is properly done. But there are one or two which have been accused of not paying their employees properly because end may they want it to be manufactured in cheap, right? This is a local producer. Pavam thing will be, you know, asked to sell their uh, garment at very less rate. So imagine I am the one making the t-shirt as a local producer. A square will be like, hello, I will give you only, if I have given say 50,000 shirts, it will tell that, okay, for 50,000 shirts, I will give you 5 lakh rupees. So what is happening? What I am getting exploited, right? So these low scale workers can get exploited, right? So normally in such cases, sometimes the way the labor conditions happen, the quality, the price, all of this right here can get affected. Yes, this part is important, but I'm going through it because it's kind of like a story. Four points that are there, right? And of course, as per the syllabus, they want, want us to focus more on globalization, technology, foreign trade, investment, liberalization bit, which is why, you know, I am um, going through this part slightly faster than normal. Sachin, you come back and watch the video. No problem. Or don't watch it also. Up to you. Okay. Are we clear? Are we all clear with this? Yes, Jishna, in some cases, in some villages also, they have these manufacturing setups. That's why if you look at it, no, a lot of uh, small vendors will have all these fancy brands also. Okay. Are we clear? Awesome. Now, quickly going on to NCRT corner, right? See, this chapter, now, now that I'm, you know, teaching you this chapter, how many of you are thinking, ma'am, this is so easy. What is this chapter? How many of you are feeling that I was unnecessarily stressing over this chapter? I know, right? More or less. See, they, they offer various services, Ankit. They offer various services. Okay, ma'am, I am not. I see. Okay. Tanushri, I was not keeping well. That is why, Bacha, I'll take it soon. Rajkumar, I am not, but I know that all of you want me to take your names. In the meanwhile, don't forget to hit the like button on this video also. G20, I will cover it towards the end, so not to worry. Yes? Awesome. We are halfway through already, more or less. So here, interlinking may, how do they do it, right? One is they set up production jointly, right? So that is something we discussed. And how this benefits them? The benefit is twofold. So here what will happen, MNC is get providing the money, it is giving newer machines, it will also provide them with technology and on the other hand the local company is going to manufacture for them, right? Then of course we see that the second one is to buy the local company, example is that of Cargill Foods which was an American based MNC that bought Parak Foods. As a result what happened, all the oil refineries which was under Parak Foods came into Cargill which is why now Cargill is the largest manufacturer of edible oil. So thereby by buying such companies that also becomes their own. Then of course, what do we see? Another way is where MNCs from developed countries, right? They go 
they give orders to smaller producers so this happens in the garment sector footwear sports items so so that they are able to manufacture it at a large scale now one thing that i need all of you to have a look right production in these so what what is for what is necessary for us production in these are widely dispersed in different parts so this is again bringing us to globalization right it is all scattered in different parts of the country but nonetheless they are all still interlinked so if they give you this statement saying production is widely dispersed when it comes to let's say in manufacturing countries but we see that yet different countries are interlinked how then we'll have to justify with this yes hello anil i am doing good how are you very happy to see you here okay climate will come soon climate will come soon what is the meaning of tremendous tremendous means more right ha karthik if you watch full revision then it's okay you can go because pretty much it's the same concept right theek hai okay awesome all of you i can see that many of you here have given me the answers cool now this is a case study now this case study could also come a little bit which is why this right here is important which is based on ford motors so i would recommend that you go through this case study don't stress about learning the numbers but go through the case studies because it can come right now globalization had one aspect which was foreign investments which we are clear and now we know how that foreign investment can come into the country they can tie up with a local company they can buy the local company or they can provide people with the money and then sort of build their brand right so we are all clear with what is um, the foreign investment now the second concept that we need to know is foreign trade now what is trade trade is basically when there is exchange of goods and services right so whenever there is good exchange between good and service for example this is me this is my country okay and this is akriti's country right this is akriti's country now what is happening here we see that i have rice okay and akriti has wheat now i want the wheat akriti has and akriti needs the rice so i will sell the rice and akriti in turn is going to give me wheat wheat right so here what is happening there is a exchange involving what involving some goods right so here we spoke in terms of goods or else what could it be it could be in the form of service also now we know that india when you look at it globally plays or rather people come to us for services for example customer services so on and so forth right so in this particular case what do we see if let's say akriti has large population of skilled workers many people who are skilled that means they have gone through education but they don't have enough employment now what happens on the other hand i have lots of money i have lots of money with me but i do not have enough skilled workers so i will go to akriti for skilled workers and in turn i will invest that money so in this case this is what we call as foreign trade where there is exchange of goods and services between or at least two countries now why is this necessary because it facilitates movement and goods between countries not just movement of countries i mean goods and services but also facilitates movement of people ideas and technology now i told you right imagine i'm working in india but i'm working for a mnc and there is a project happening in australia now as a result me being an indian i am able to travel to australia in order to carry out a project right so there is movement of me from my country to australia which means when i go there is flow of ideas flow of technology this also provides an opportunity for producers to sell their products beyond the local market now this is important to understand when we go into learning more about trade and trade barriers right now understand that if i am here and i get all indian based products but let's assume that maybe fancy makeup companies from outside come into our country now what happens 
let's assume that more competition, more option is there for me, right? Oh, I don't need to buy lipstick only from say this brand. I can buy it from here, I can buy it from here, I can buy it from here. Then I will go for what is really good, right? So then I will go to buy what is really good for me, yes? Which means what will happen? Me as a buyer, right? I am the buyer here. I have more choice. Now, instead of choosing from two people, I can buy from, I have options to buy from 10 brands, right? So, thereby what will happen? There is increased competition, more competition between consumers and everybody, I mean, more competition between products, more competition between brands. Now, everybody will strive to make a better version so that end may they buy what I they are making, right? So, that's how integration of markets play a very important role, yes? Now, of course, we have the examples of how Chinese toys have been sold in India, where Chinese manufacturers found that toys were being in India, where they were sold at a high price, right? Now, eventually, we saw that Chinese price that are there, the Chinese toys, they were being sold at cheaper prices with new designs, which is why in one year, we see that over 80 to 90% of the market was occupied by these guys, right? Thereby, we see that toys are now cheaper in the Indian market than earlier. Yes? So, here you need to have a look at this aspect. This case is very, very important for us. This right here is important. Ma'am, does this competition adver affect adversely? Yeah, it can. Now, if you look at it, right? I don't want to name brands. But if you look at makeup itself, if... Now, of course, we see that there's a lot of luxury brands coming in, right? There's a lot of luxury brands which are coming in. There are a lot of high-end brands which are coming in into the makeup industry. I know this because I was reading an article about it. Now, what happens? We see that in such cases, there's also a little bit of brand value that, oh, I own a lipstick by this particular brand or my phone is by this fancy brand. So, there's always a brand value that it comes with, right? So, at times what can happen, the naturally homegrown brands face a lot of competition, right? So, that is what is important. TK. Awesome, all of you. Okay. See, quickly, Justice, I know in different places, different revision is happening. If you want to study here, you study here. Otherwise, it's okay. TK. Okay. Ma'am, how can the government of India play a major role to play, make globalization more fair? I will tell you when we do liberalization. Yes? Ma'am, is it fine if I read whole chapter and prepare questions because only two topics? See, why I am telling you is this is a full chapter explanation. I am not doing it only with respect to for you to just mug up and write some answers in board exams. Tomorrow, if you need to understand some concepts so that you write answers effectively, there are one, two questions that you need to learn about, right? But if you want, I know economics is like this, but it's okay. If you come back later, you watch. Otherwise, why are you unnecessarily commenting? Hello, Priya. Hello. Topics are overlapping. Exactly. There are some overlapping topics. Which is why might as well I teach you the whole bit. Right? Okay. Now see. Students who have are not going to. Who are disturbing the class. Now I will start timing you out. Or else you can leave the class. Nobody is asking you to stay. Okay. So with this is what I would like to take on advantages of foreign trade. How is it beneficial? It is beneficial because. How is foreign trade beneficial? Because we see that there is expansion of market beyond the domestic country. While we see that along with this, there is new source of investment, new sources of capital coming in along with raw materials. Thereby, what do we see? Increased choice of goods to buy. And of course, sometimes things could be available at a lower price, right? Language barriers is when you don't understand a certain language, right? For example, if you go to Germany and you don't understand German, then you are facing a language barrier with that person because you don't understand it. Ma'am, is it... Uh, Ma'am, MNC is multinational company or multinational cooperation? Multina both can be said. Multinational company is also right. Yes? Okay. So quickly, we're going over to the NCRT corner with wherein we look at foreign trade and integration of markets, right? So what is foreign trade and integration of markets? Again, 
we know that foreign trade is not happening from now it's happening from way before so if you look at it it connects india south asia right especially way back in history also our east india company is the most easiest example that we can think of right where in all the way from britain they've come to india in order to trade so here there is integration of markets so here foreign trade creates an opportunity for producers to reach beyond domestic market right so here what happens it goes two ways one is they coming here or another one is us going there right so here you imagine aishu's bakery was just in mg road in bangalore but with the help of a foreign investment i am able to expand to different parts of the world tomorrow i might open one in delhi i might open one in mumbai next thing you know i have one in dubai then of course i have one in new york right so in this particular case i am going beyond my domestic market and here we see that it i can not only sell in a i can not only sell in a market which is located within my country right and we also see that in other cases we see that uh, i'm also able to compete in markets in other countries so now i issues bakery which was in my country i am now competing with us i am competing with dubai i am competing in germany so now i'm competing with the bakers outside as well right theek hai now along with this as a buyer i have more choice right i have more choice and along with that this way we see that import of goods produced in another country is also able to expand right so thereby this again why am i going through this they will give you this topic right foreign trade thus resulted in connecting different markets or integration of markets justify if they ask you this now you know what to write yes that is why this right here is going to be important theek hai Ma'am, next thing you know, ma'am is going to. I, I don't think I'll be a billionaire. No. Honestly, I feel like living a normal life, right? Having what makes you content is more than enough. ठीक है. हाँ, I know these justify questions only will come from this chapter. That's why whatever is highlighted in bold, please don't ignore it, right? Please don't ignore. Read through it little bit so that you know what is the answer to it. So now, if you look at it, we have seen that. we have got an understanding of what is globalization how the interconnectedness is happening right how it is happening so if you look at it a large part now this part is something where i need you all to pay attention to large part of foreign trade is controlled by these mncs we are all clear how a large part now we are clear see reason why i taught you all of that is so that you get an idea of what do i what do i mean by mnc is contributing towards it if you know how it contributes what it does and all of that you are going to be clear with the rest of the concepts which means writing answers becomes easy even if it becomes thoda ulat pulat even if they twist it and give it to you you will be having so many points right toxic oh, tell me your name once again i forgot i know you toxic as ever i forgot your name but go back to the beginning of this session you will be able to find uh, deleted topics for or just the topics for go 2024 right okay so with this everybody just give me one moment yeah so with this we've understood how globalization is a large part of foreign trade and how it is controlled by the mncs right so in this particular case what do we see in this case we see that let's assume so here we are going to go to our ford motors um example right so here we saw that ford motors was not only producing cars for the indian market but it was also exporting to other developed countries and it was exporting car components for many factories all over the world right so thereby we see that most mncs are involving in substantial trade of goods and services what do i mean by this now this is my ford motors now what is my ford motors doing it has come to india what has it done it has decided to make a car for the indian audience right or for the indian market now as a result of this what has happened we are making cars but it does not just make cars for the indian market it is also trading the cars to other countries it is selling to different different countries and along with this it is also telling sending car parts also 
So in this case, when we talk about MNCs, right? When we talk about MNCs, they are not just manufacturing and selling. They will also, right? They will also export cars and they will export car parts as well. Just give me one minute. Okay. Yes, thank you all of you. We'll take a break after this. Are I think 25, 20 more minutes and we're going to be done with this. It's a very simple topic. So likewise, if you see, it means that MNCs, now so far when I taught you, when I say MNCs also involve substantial trade in goods and services, it means that so far when I taught you whatever we've learned so far, one main idea you got is MNC is there, it is investing money, right? All of you, all of you thought ki MNC is there, it is investing money and it is manufacturing things, right? But now you need to understand that the intent of doing all of that, bringing in that foreign investment, connecting different parts of the world, organizing a complex manufacturing process is for what reason? In order to trade, right? See, they will get all that money when they do import, export, right? Or when they start selling things, only then they'll get that money. So they are substantially, that means they are considerably involved in trading goods and services. As a result, what happens? They, as a, the result of greater foreign investment and greater foreign trade means that more integration of markets and production across countries. See, we have so many countries. Now imagine these are our major players, right? These are some of the major playing countries like your USA, you have UK, you have Japan, right? And maybe you have some of the European countries which are there. But if these MNCs, they integrate, right? Various countries together. Then the kinds of services, let's say that we get in US or the kind of service to a matter of fact we get in India. We are also able to give it across different countries in Africa. We are able to bring in different countries, let's say, in South America. So thereby what happens, we see that more and more people have access, right? So more and more people, there's greater integration across production and market. Now, why is production important? Because when more integration of markets happen, more job opportunities are created, thereby overall economic growth also, right? So that's where our globalization plays a very, very important role. Yes? So are we clear with this aspect? Are we clear? Yes? Okay. So now, what are the dimensions, right? What are the various dimensions in which we are able to look at globalization? Many of you are asking me, ma'am, what is the danger of globalization? What will happen if globalization is there or not there? Now see, you are connecting different countries together. So there are three dimensions we can look at. There is a political dimension to it. There is a cultural dimension to it. There is an economic dimension to it, right? Now, let's start with a simple one, which is the uh, cultural dimension, or I would say a easy one. Now, when there is more influx right so when there is more interconnectedness amongst different countries don't you think that there is an influence of foreign ideas uh, foreign commodities in our day-to-day -day life yes don't we have a look at it don't don't you think that there is going to be an influence of foreign ideas now you go back to the example of let's say finding a ikea store in Bangalore, right? IKEA store in Bangalore or as a matter of fact, let's assume Ganesh food stall. Ganesh food stall is giving you pasta. It is giving you white sauce pasta for 50 rupees, right? It is giving you white sauce pasta for 50 rupees. It is giving you a fancy Zinger burger for another say 80 rupees. So in this particular case, what is happening? We see that there is a lot of influx of foreign ideas. 
Similarly, if you go to London, okay, if you go to London, you will find one Saravana Bhavan there. You will find a fa you will find an Indian outlet where they will be selling Chole Bhature. There will be one chart store, right? So if you look at it, we see that there is a flow of ideas, whether in it be in any place. As a matter of fact, one of my friends, he is actually in uh, he's in Netherlands. And he was telling me that there is a biryani store in Netherlands. So that is what we look at the cultural dimension of it, right? So what do we mean by the cultural dimension? There is influence of foreign ideas and it goes both ways, right? It's not that only we are getting influenced. Yes, it's important for us to stay rooted to our own culture. But there are things that let's say we can adopt that are good, right? So in this particular case, influence of foreign ideas, commodities, they can influence our day-to-day -day life. Now, of course, we know that there's also a political dimension to it. Now, what is the political dimension? Now, we know that if any MNC has to come to my country, let's say our country, and set up a manufacturing unit, or let's say they are setting up anything, in this case, what do we see? We see that events of one country can affect the events and policies in another country also. So, in this case, I don't want to take names, of course, because it could be very politically dicey, but we know that if there is a tie up of let's say manufacturing, there's also the governments which are involved, right? So let's assume some event has taken place in one country. Now, whatever has happened in the country, good or bad, it can equally have an influence on the other countries, right? That's why we see that geopolitical is a term that's floating around very recently, where we see that the advent of globalization has brought in so much interconnectedness, that we see it impacts political relationship between the countries also, right? Okay, now we also see that there is an economic dimension that we are more concerned about, which is our flow of goods, our flow of services, flow of capital and flow of labor. What do I mean by flow of goods and services? That is what we have discussed as trading, right? So when we trade, what happens? Imagine India is trading with, let's say, Spain. So we see that if there is constant trade happening, then it also means that it can improve the economy. We mean, means that Spain needs all this from us, right? It's importing all of that from us. Now imagine if it decides to not import, then we also see that Spain will get affected and we can see that that way, right? We see that flow of goods and services will happen how? Across trades. Now, same way we saw that there will be flow of capital. MNCs, if they decide to invest in your company, it means that there is money coming in, right? And there is also flow of labor. Now, flow of labor is what we have a look at, right? So, in the case of flow of labor, I told you, this is where migration comes into the picture. Now, what is migration? Now you know, right, if you look at many of your family members, many of your cousins, many of them would probably be working outside the country, right? I'm sure we have one family member who is not working in India. They are based either in US, London, Dubai, right? Some are in Australia, some are in, um, I don't know, the closest country that I can think of probably would be Germany. We have that one relative in every family for sure. They will either be studying there or they will study to get a job there and they will decide to set, settle there. So here what is happening from our home country or our own country, we are migrating to a new country, right? So there is flow of labor as well. Yes. So in this particular case, we see that there is movement of people. So they usually move from one country to another, normally in search of better income, better, better jobs, better education as well. And over a period of time, we also see that this influx, this influx of people is also regulated by governments, right? Recently, if you look at it, they release. There are certain criteria that you have to meet. Not like today I've decided, okay, children, bye, I'm going to Australia tomorrow. I can't just wake up one day and decide that ah, tada, bye, bye, I'm going to Australia. No, there are sort of requirements that is needed. Now, are there any disadvantages of foreign trade? One of the disadvantages that I can tell you with a very recent example is that there could be that there could be some goods that we are dependent on entirely on another country. Now, a very recent example I can give you is normally India exports a lot of rice to the United Nations. 
Now, why I'm saying United Nations every time? To the United States, right? And recently, it decided to reduce how much it was exporting. Now, as a result, what happened? We see that that will impact the people there, right? So, when in such cases, we see that, let's say, we are entirely dependent or we are majorly dependent on, on, let's say, the import coming in from another country. What will happen is that is when foreign trade can have a disadvantage. Well, let's say if that import doesn't happen, it could have an impact, right? Okay. So this is what we look at the dimensions of globalization, right? What are the various ways in which globalization has impacted our life? It has a political dimension, a cultural dimension that we all experience, and of course, how it impacts the overall economy, right? Are we all clear? Yes. Yeah, we, we have to get visa only, then I can go, right? Now, what fuels, right? How do we improve or how does globalization sort of impact us? Yes? Now, we see that globalization over a period of time has stimulated or has accelerated for, a, for quite some time, right? And one major fuel that has uh, triggered globalization is technology, right? Now, if you look at technology, Way back in those days, see right now everything is one click away. For everything or the other, you have one app, right? You want to go from my, you like every day I use a travel app to come to office, right? I am just one click away. I don't need to go struggle and wait for an auto, see if the auto is telling yes or no. Everything is now made so easy for us. And that is because of the rapid uh, advancement in technology. So, in the past 50 or so years, we've also seen that in the transporting, uh, in the field of transportation as well, we have seen that there has been advancement of technology as well. So, especially how has technology in the field of transportation become better? We see that it has reduced time of travel, reduced time of delivery of goods, thereby reducing overall prices. Now, you imagine when we do import, export, Firstly, you are not importing 1 kg rice or you are not, I mean, you are not exporting 1 kg rice, you are not exporting 1 packet of lace chips or you are not exporting, you know, um, like we are not exporting, uh, you know, 1, um, I don't know, we are not doing in easy numbers, right? What are we doing it? We are doing in thousands of thou and thousands, right? Or sometimes in lakhs and lakhs also. So in such cases, what would happen when the numbers are high? Aren't there chances for error? Chances that there could be some counting error, there could be one uh, documenting error, and as a result, what would happen? It will affect how we transport, right? It will affect how we transport this. So, as a result, what has happened? It can make communication difficult also. But over a period of time, we have Excel sheets where we can document everything. We have the details of every product we are exporting, every detail of the product we are importing. Communication has also become easy, right? Even information technology has advanced over a period of time that it is easy to communicate. Today, you will not sit and write a letter to me and put it on a post. You will come to YouTube and tell, Hare ma'am, I have this doubt, please tell me. Otherwise, earlier, you had to send me either, you know, maybe by mail or, you know, I, I don't know how many people even now, may, I mean, of course, for official purposes, we use Gmail and everything. But for personal purposes, of course, we see that most often we have a communication over the phone and all of that. So channels of communication has increased considerably, right? So we see that through satellite communication, telecommunication, internet and so on, we see that we are able to communicate easily. So quickly to revise. This is very, very important, everybody. So please start underlining it little more seriously. So we see that over a period of time, we now have un understood how MNCs are looking for cheap labor for their production, right? Now foreign investments have also been increasing. Now if you look at it, if you read the previous part and this part, don't you think all of this is more or less the same? Same story they are telling across different topics, but understanding the MNC bit was little important so that you write answers easily. That's all, right? So we know that foreign investments and foreign trades are made by MNCs and they are rapidly rising, right? So here we have an example of Ford Motors given to you and how we see that this has elaborated in substantial trade. What is substantial trade? Substantial trade that is there is basically the goods and services, right? How you are considerably trading 
different products, different services between two, um, let's say between two or more countries. Now we see that when there is greater foreign trade, greater, I mean, greater foreign investment, greater foreign trade, more integration of markets, right? And who plays an important role? It is our MNCs. So thereby we see that more goods and services are being, say, circulated or it is moving. So as a result, we also see that different countries are coming together. So here we see that besides movement of goods and services, we also see that uh, through movement of people, also countries are brought together where people go from one country to another in search of better income, better jobs, so on and so forth, right? Thereby what happens? We see that this right here is important. Rakhi bacha, substantial trade means it is considerably, that means more trading that is happening, right? Now see, these questions are important where what is the role of MNCs in the globalization process? Here, these two points, how they bring in foreign trade and how they bring in foreign investment. These two points are very, very important, right? Okay, next of course, Another question is, what are the various ways in which countries are linked? These are the three points that you need to write down, right? How are various countries linked? You need to have these three pointers mentioned. Last but not the least, globalization by connecting countries shall result in what? Lesser competition between producers, greater competition amongst producers, or no change in competition. What do you think is the answer to this? Everybody, quickly, can you tell me? What do you think is the answer? So we are talking about if we integrate markets, what is going to happen? If we integrate markets, are, is, does this mean that if I am a producer, I will not have competition? 10 more people have decided to enter my country, so no competition. Okay. While on the other hand, there will be no change. As a matter of fact, no. While on the other hand, we see that there will be greater competition, right? So MCQ based questions can come in this manner. So everybody, please, please pay attention. Yes. So are we all feeling a little confident? Now moving on to the next bit of it, factors that have enabled globalization. Please star mark this, put important, important and put three V's. V, 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 important, right? How has rapid improvement in technology helped us? So we know that there are several improvement in transportation technology, which has improved faster delivery of goods across larger distances, right? Larger distances. So here we have talked about or they have given about how over a period of time air transport has become easy which means volume of goods can be imported more, huge containers have started to become produced which also means that uh, larger containers means more number, more volume. Similarly, if I have to transfer it to large distances, air transport has also become easy, right? Or it's become cheaper to afford. Thereby, I am able to transfer greater volumes. So please star mark these two points as well. They are very important for us to go through. Now, along with this, we also know about the rising importance in information and communication technology, right? So we have information and communication technology, wherein over a period of time, internet, telecommunication has changed things, wherein we are able to communicate even from remote areas. Today, if I decide to go to Himachal Pradesh, I decide to go to Manali and I want to take class from Manali, Aram say I can take it. Why? Because even in a remote area in Manali, let's say, I will be able to take it because of accessibility. So through satellite communication and all the access that I have, I will be able to take class. Now along with this, we also see how over a period of time, emails, voicemails, all of this is happening and it's very low cost, right? Not a lot of money is there, but it is happening at low cost. But yet, we see that we require electricity, we have certain requirements still, right? So using IT in globalization, this can come as a case question. This can come as a case based question where they have spoken about, you can solve this case, this right here is very easy, right? So they're talking about how say Delhi office, say London office, they are connected, right? 
So are we all clear? Yes? I will give you a brief in G20 summit very soon. But I hope that my pace of teaching was fine today. I know I... Was I very fast? I hope I wasn't too fast. How are we feeling? Everybody is like, ma'am. Ankit, for that I need to come to trade barriers. That is why. Ma'am, could you explain the picture which is said, what is globalization? Okay. See, it says globalization is fun. Be careful. That's our world you are playing with. Someday you have to pay a price. So here it is with respect to you have these big, big corporates. You have these uh, big MNCs, right? But we also know that in order for low cost production, we see that there are people who get impacted, right? Sometimes we see that there are not so sustainable practices that are implemented, which can have an impact on the development as well right which can have an impact on our country and that is where when we discuss g20 summit talking about sustainable developmental goals how we bring about a proper kind of global like when we do globalization also it has to be fair right so when i say fair it should not be that there is one country exploiting the other or let's say no more than countries getting exploited i would say that people should not get exploited right yes so are we clear? Are we all clear with this? Yes or no? In the meanwhile students, if you've enjoyed this class, see so far I did not tell you at all because I was so busy sort of um, in the flow of teaching. But if you did enjoy the class, don't forget to hit the like button on this video. See, I know you might be watching it at your own pace. Sometimes many of you might not watch it right now. Many of you might have your exams going on. So in this particular case, whatever it be, whenever you are watching it, hope that you are enjoying this class, right? Now, of course, I have last bit of the chapter left, right? I have a last bit of the chapter, but before I go over to that, how about we take a two minute water break? I have a little bit left on trade barriers and liberalization, which is very important, right? So for trade barrier and liberalization, we will go to it, but maybe a two minute water break and then we will jump right into it. Okay, so I will resume at 8.45 p.m. It is going to be a quick water break. More so for me than you, so quickly. Very happy to hear that, Bunny's Cook, that you have written your science exam well. When you guys have got your marks, right, once your pre-board papers or your PT papers, periodic test papers come in, let me know the answers in the comments, right? I mean, give me your marks in the comments of this video. You guys wait for one chance to tell that I'm late, OP. It's like, let's wait for ma'am to be late. But yeah, I know I need to, um, you know, 
make sure that I am a little more punctual. But yeah, thought I'll give you one extra minute. So we are back and we'll go on to the last part of it, right? Now, in order to, uh, yeah, I know I was just 25 seconds late, but still, no, we need to say I was late. It's okay, it's chill only. Now you remember our Chinese toys wala example? How many of you remember Chinese toys wala example? Let's go back to that. Where is it? Chinese toys. We all remember our Chinese toys example, right? What is it? What is the intent of Chinese toys? We saw that in the case of Chinese toys, they were sold at cheaper prices and new designs. As a result, within a year, we were able to increase, right? There was an increase in the production, yes? But keeping that in mind, imagine that if, let's assume, there were these Chinese toys that were coming into the country and in order to bring, let's say, one toy into the country, they had to pay some import money on it, right? Or let's say there was a tax which was put on it in order to import toys. What do you think will happen, right? If assuming there is a Chinese toy, right? There's a Pikachu here on the side. Now this one Pikachu in order to it be, in order to sell it in India. Yes, in order to sell it in India, the government will say, okay, you have to pay tax, right? I will charge some tax on this. Which means now this selling toys, right? Or the selling price that is there, we see that the selling price is no longer going to be say 20 rupees, 30 rupees, right? But rather we'll see that it's going to be 20 rupees plus the tax that is being imposed on it. Which means from 20 rupees, it has probably let's say 35 rupees tax has been charged. As a result, what has happened? This will now become 55 rupees. Yes. So the overall, if we start charging tax on this, it will no longer be cheap right? But rather we see that there is a higher price which has been charged on the imported toy, right? Now what will happen? If it becomes higher, then it is no longer cheap for us, right? We see that it is no longer cheap. And as a result, what will happen? We see that import from China will reduce, right? Import from China will reduce because people will be like, why should I pay so much money? So the demand of the product will come down. Because nobody wants it anymore. Too much money. No, not many people are buying. As a result, more of Indian toys are going to be sold. Chinari, I've already answered. Please don't spam. So what we saw as an example there was a trade barrier, right? Now what is a trade barrier? A trade barrier are basically, a barrier is not a physical barrier here. Where people will say, no, you cannot bring this in. It is not a physical barrier. But rather, they are policies. Now, what are these policies? These policies are implemented in order to restrict international trade, right? So, in order to restrict how much international trade comes in from other countries, we call these as trade barriers. Now, how do these trade, what are these policies? Policies that are there could be taxes, right? So, I could put a tax on the imported, um, let's say imported, um, um, product that is coming in or there could be a certain quota right now what are quotas now before all of you ask me over and over again see quotas are basically the number it is the limit right it is the limit or it is the basically how much number of goods can I import right so how many goods can I import during that trade period so it is the limit in terms of number right and of course, increasing the price of imports, right? In general, if the importing price only becomes costly, maybe then again, there'll be less demand, right? So in this case, what do we see? Tax on imports as an example, right? Now, how does government, how can government play a role? Which is what Ankit has been asking me for a long, long time. That, ma'am, how can government control the trading that is happening? See, when there's import and export happening, the government can use these trade barriers to regulate, right? So they can either increase how much of it can come in or they can decrease it, right? So when I say regulate, it means to increase and decrease. So they can regulate the foreign trade that happens and thereby they can decide how much of, let's say, each good should come in. So again, going back to a very basic example, right? Basic example where I have rice, 
I have wheat, right? And let's assume I'm taking the makeup product. Or phones, for example, right? Phones. Now, it could be that imagine if you are importing rice and wheat, right? Now, if I'm importing rice and wheat into India, which is already an agricultural country, why do we need imported rice and wheat? My, the government will think, okay, I can regulate how much money I am going to, let's say, uh, I'm going to regulate how much of imported rice and wheat I want. Because thereby I can also grow, I can improve the Indian variety of it, right? So India may rice and wheat is, we are already agricultural country, we are growing rice and wheat. So why do import? So if people want to, let's say, trade rice and wheat, they may import it at a, or they may charge a certain tax price to it or they may have a certain quota to it right so in such a case what will happen the government is regulating how much of rice and wheat should come into the country or another vice versa way to do is okay we are producing so much rice and wheat now i can also export rice and wheat as well so thereby this right here is something that we need to have an understanding about i gave you a basic example ayushman where i said rice and wheat but i'm not going into the technical examples of it right i am giving you rough hypothetical examples yes these are hypothetical examples for you to understand how we can regulate it similarly if you look at um imported phones right or if you look at phones which are being assembled and which are uh, not let's say being assembled or manufactured in india or they are being manufactured or assembled elsewhere their prices will be relatively higher right their prices will be relatively higher when compared to let's say something that has been assembled here so thereby the government plays a very important role in regulating foreign trade deciding how much should come how much should go right they will have an eye on all of it right so are we clear with what is a trade barrier yes now why has this come into the picture in the first place why are there certain policies now in our case if you look at our country right in our country we see that of course we were a colonized country so the britishers that are there right the britishers of course came in and are once they left our economy was not at a state right it was not at a state where um, we were strong as an economy thereby the kind of agriculture the condition of the agriculture the condition of industries was not that great so in order to support the domestic producers, right? That means locally, in order to improve their condition, we decided to put up some trade barriers, right? And this was a main step taken towards protection from foreign competition, right? In order to protect our domestic producers from foreign competition. But what happened? We saw that there was restrictions put on foreign trades. Now, this was around 1950s and 1960s where the industries were just up and coming. And at that point, we see that if we had allowed too much competition to come in, our industries would have not sustained, right? That is why we see that at that point of time, India allowed only essential items to come in, like petrol, uh, let's say petrol, machines and all that, right? Now, a very, very important point that I will write on screen that you all need to know. See, at some point, we see that at all developed countries, right? At all developed countries during the early stages of their development. Yes. So during their early stages of development, we see that at some point or the other or in some way or the other, they have given protection to their domestic producers. Right. So if you look at a developed country like the US, it is not that they became developed in one way. But at some point, there were certain policies that was implemented where they had protection that was implemented, right? There was protection implemented to their domestic producers. Only then they decided on foreign imports, so on and so forth, right? So quickly, uh, Lee Fran, to take your question. Uh, Lee Fran has given us an assertion reason question that I would like to take. Assertion says that Indian government had to put up trade barriers to foreign trade and foreign investment after independence. Reason being that this was done to protect the producers outside the country from local producers. Lee Fran has asked a question that I have given in the Google form test. See, why was the trade barrier put up? Was it to protect people outside our country or was it protected to, uh, was it protected or was it done to protect domestic producers? 
it was done to protect us right the domestic producers which is why those restrictions were made right so here the reason is wrong but that is a question i have given you in the google form test right okay so this was in 1950s 1960s right but over a period of time what happened close to 1991 there were some economic reforms that were being made because now our economy was at a state where we could compete with say other producers right so we see that there was some discussion made where in the economic reform policy they decided that hey let's open up our economy to the rest of the world because we believe that now if we bring in people from other countries there will be more competition to our domestic producers right thereby they thought that the quality will also improve we are able to be get better and better quality so what did they do there was fewer restrictions made on foreign trade and foreign investments thereby they also opened it up to private firms where they had some it was not you know completely controlled by the government they had some power where they could take certain decisions and of course foreign firms were given permissions in order to set up their office in india so thereby what do we see we see that although the barriers we see that to a large extent india had removed barriers on trade and investments right thereby we saw that there was easy import and export of goods factories goods and there was a lot of import and export of goods and services which also meant that more factories yes more factories were allowed to be set up okay now this what we just saw right this removal of barriers and restrictions set by the government on what on trading and economy is what we call as liberalization yes now everybody pay attention ankit this is for you what is globalization the rapid interconnectedness and integration of different countries is what we call as globalization but liberalization to liberate or to make something free right so in order to remove get rid of a barrier to free us from a barrier with respect to trade and economy we call that as liberalization which was set by the government so thereby we see that with liberalization what was allowed we see that businesses were allowed to make their own decisions with respect to import and export now government will not impose too much of a restriction like the amount of restriction they were putting on trading will now reduce right and along with this which means that again again to reiterate my points more amount of foreign trade and foreign investment coming in yes thereby we see that we see that this right here is going to help in economic growth right now we although we believe that trade barriers no longer exist that is not the case right we see that trade barriers even now right even now between some countries there are barriers that still exist ideally it should be free flowing right on a very ideal yes on a very ideal um, scenario there should be no trade barriers easy peasy you know flow of um, what do you say easy peasy flow of trading should happen but that's not the case right we see that organizations like the wto which is the world trade organization believes that more countries need to have liberalized policies like india which allows for more free trades allows restricted trade barring and promotes more international cooperation but yet we see that in some cases there are cases where it does not happen so quickly to give you an example right we see that i like to take this one which is based on the agricultural practices so here we see that let's go through this one we see that agricultural sector in our country contributes a large has a large contribution towards gdp yes now if you compare this to let's say usa which has a share of 1% right which means that agriculture contributes only 1% to the gdp and its total share in employment is only 0.5 and yet this very small percentage of people are engaged in agriculture so even though only 0.5% of people are employed in this we see that a large amount of those people get large amount of money from the us for what for production and for exports to other countries due to this massive money they receive us farmers are able to sell their farm products at an abnormally low price 
See, they are getting money from US, the government. So they are making lots of money and they are selling it at a very low price also. Now at this rate, what happens? At this rate, we see that surplus farm products are sold in other country markets at low prices, thereby affecting the farmers. So developing countries are saying that, see, we reduced our trade barriers, but you have ignored the rules, right? And you have continued to pay your farmers large sums of money. So is this free and fair trade? So have you understood this bit? See, what is happening? You have a country like the US. Now there are only 0.5 percentage of farmers who are here. That means very low population. While India, wherein 60 percent of the population is doing farming. Now in this case, because the government is funding it, right? They are putting in money. We see that they receive large sums of money for export to other countries also. As a result, what will happen? They sell it at a very low price, right? They sell it at a very low price. As a result, we see that they now are not practicing free and fair trade, right? Because now for import, they will charge some amount of money, right? So in all these cases, we see that in this particular case, even though we have lowered our barriers, we have not, we are not effectively practicing proper trade, yes? Okay. Awesome. How has it affected the life of Indians? Our day-to-day -day life has only changed, right? Due to globalization, the kind of clothes we wear, the kind of phones that we use, right? The kind of communication that we experience, advancement of technology, we see that over a period of time is because of influx of different ideas coming in from different places. So here we need to focus more on the impact of the how cultural ideas have come in, right? And along with that, we see that more job opportunities have been created as a result of these MNCs setting it up okay so quickly to go back this topic is very very important students liberalization of foreign trade and foreign investments so here they started out with the example of Chinese toys and we see that how if there was some tax imported on it Chinese toys will no longer be cheap in the Indian market and thereby it will reduce how they would prosper so tax on imports is what we call as trade barrier or these are restrictions that have been set up. Now why do the government use, why do government use trade barriers in order to regulate trade? Basically how much trade is happening, increase or decrease, right? And what kind of goods and how much each of it should come. This point is very important students, please star mark it. They can ask you how does the government regulate the foreign trade that happens. So this right here is super important. Now we see that the Indian government after independence, they can ask you how the Indian government used trade barriers to their benefit post independence. So we know that this was considered necessary in order to protect producers from foreign competition. So this was a time when if competition from foreign imports came in, our industries would not have survived, which is why India allowed imports of only essential items. Now we see that all developed countries do this practice in order to grow. Yes. So in this particular case, what do we observe? Starting around 1991, we saw that the government decided that it was time to change and they felt like more competition would improve the performance of the producers, which is why they decided that this will also help in improving their quality. So we saw that this decision of our country was supported by various international organizations like the WTO. Thereby, they removed the barriers by a large extent, right? And this meant that goods could be imported and exported easily and factories could be set up. Now, again, this point will come as justified. Removing barriers or restrictions set up by the government is called as liberalization. How did the Indian government achieve this? Justify. So this right here is very, very important. Now, of course, this talks about how the government did it, right? Now, of course, we see that the idea or the decision to sort of remove these trade barriers and liberalize us was, of course, promoted. Or an organization that supported us was the World Trade Organization, whose aim was to, was to liberalize international trade in general. So, they started an initiative amongst the developed countries, wherein they started to put up some rules regarding international trade, right? And we see about 160, member, 160 countries are part of it. But nonetheless, 
they say that see you have to do free trade but in practice there are people who still don't practice proper trading rules right and of course we see that agricultural the debate on agricultural products that we just discussed was a example for the same so a lot of justify questions can come from this topic so this is very very important for us to go through yes okay now last but not the least right last but not the least is india and g20 i feel like you guys were like ma'am you just tell us about g20 we will learn the rest no problem rajiv no problem india and g20 summit right see g20 summit if you know happened this year right and of course all across our capital city we saw that everything was beautifully done for the g20 summit you open any website which is officially done by the ministry we see that the g20 summit logo was there right so this right here is what is g20 in the first place right now g20 means it's a group of 20 countries right and it basically acts as a forum where wherein there is international economic cooperation so their aim right their aim is basically or what they do is they come together and they discuss matters that are responsible for strengthening global architecture and how they can govern major international or economic international economic issues now see there are like i said no because of globalization we see that now we see that there is not there is a political dimension to globalization there's an economic dimension so now it is no longer it's no longer that oh this is this country's problem i have nothing to do with it no now we see that with all the interconnectedness that has come in this problem can become another person's problem very soon which is why what do we see we see that there is a need for all countries to collectively come together work together so that they can focus on how we can build a global forum an architecture a, i would say a framework right where we can govern we can sort of you know sort of um, administer what are the things that are going on and discuss all the important economic issues that are there right okay now of course right very quickly just a minute yes so now of course in this particular case the g20 was in initially founded in 1999 right wherein we saw that as a result of the fine asian financial crisis financial ministers from the central bank and of course um, and central bank government governors came together to discuss financial issues later in 2008 it was elevated at a leader level where we saw that state governments were getting involved as a result of the economic and financial crisis that happened in 2007 2009 right and eventually we saw that it was a summit it was a proper a forum a discussion that was happening so we saw that this was held annually with rotating presidency and this year of course it was india next year it is going to be brazil right now of course over a period of time what do they do see this is also going to give you an idea talks about the macro economic situations which means what are the economic things that are happening at a global level that can impact us right along with that they talk about trade sustainable development how we can improve health agriculture energy environment climate anti corruption so on and so forth now in 2023 they have also included the au which is the african union so thereby we see that they have brought this has also been brought in as a permanent member of the g20 now which are all our countries in g20 has 19 and now we have our african union as well so in this case we see we have argentina australia brazil canada china all these countries coming in together along with regional bodies of europe eu and au right exactly eu is your european union au is your african union yes now here this g20 right so now we know what is the purpose of g20 see countries will come together and they'll be like are we have all these problems see we need to find a way to tackle them right so that is the whole point of it so you need to know these two pointers as to what is g20 why g20 next g20 in india so 2023 india in new delhi we hosted our first ever g20 summit what was our summit's theme name that is something which would be important for us to know 
the summit's theme name was vasudeva kutum kutumbakam right i might have a little bit of tamil malayalam accent to when i say that which means that one earth one family one future so this was the theme that was there in our g20 summit right and the intent why is it that we came up with this theme or why was this theme Im implemented because if you look at our roots our country's roots in ancient sanskrit text it was implemented with the goal of sustainable development right and they also exemplify lifestyle for environment which is l i f e right lifestyle for environmental for environment which talks about how over a period of time our lifestyle should be sustainable see over a period of time what has happened is we've dwelled so much into consumerism that we are no longer using resources wisely right we are going into learning more and more about uh, let's say whatever practices that we implement has a strong carbon footprint we see that it is causing climate change pollution depletion of natural resources hence from now on when we grow when we develop our countries we need to develop it sustainably responsibly lifestyle choices have to be made it is no longer about preaching anymore actionables have to be taken with our lifestyle right which is why the aim is so that we don't do it only at a nation level saying india did this india did that but as you and me as individuals we implement it in our day to day life as well so what did they talk about so some of the broad uh, pointers that were discussed were green development accelerated inclusive re resilient growth accelerating progress on sustainable developmental goals technological transformation and digital public infrastructure multilateral institution and women led development so the first point is on climate change right so many of you are asking me what is climate change mitigation now we all know we are at the deep rooted level where climate change has had a very drastic impact it has started to bring about such drastic patterns that it is affecting agriculture it is affecting the day to day life right so as a result what do we see we see that it can have an impact on the economy also right it can start having an impact on the economy which is why now when we talk about tackling climate change see now what has happened has happened how can we control it how can we contain this that is where climate change mitigation comes into the picture now along with that we also talk about emphasis on climate finance and technology that means how am i going to implement on technologies that is going to help me sort of tackle this what are the energy transitions that i have to make right so when i say energy transitions i mean clean energy right ha huh, see delhi pollution exactly bangalore may the kind of and even right now as a matter of fact lot of rainfall patterns have also changed that is also a very big thing to control or i would say a very good big factor yes so energy transition in developing countries into more clean energy yes that is something that we have discussed about life we have already done no life is what life is what we discussed here lifestyle for environment yes okay no problem jishna come back and watch the last bit later now along with this we see that you have inclusive growth which means that we support our small scale enterprises our medium scale enterprises so that they are also able to trade we have proper laws implemented for labor so on and so forth then sustainable developmental goals are something which is set out an agenda so if you look at it sustainable development goals have an agenda for 2030 so here mainly we focus more that means now we need to make more and more progress on this and along with that if you look at it we see that technological transformation and digital public infrastructure so here we promote technology where we are able to have more places right more places of let's say institution areas where we are educate we are able to educate more people bring them to use technology so on and so forth right so similarly if you look at it in all these cases bring about when you talk about bring in multilateral institution bring in more inclusiveness make sure that you know more representatives of communities are there even at a 21st century and women led women led development is of course 
on the aspects of women empowerment, women representation, so that as we grow, we empower them also. SDG stands for Sustainable Developmental Goals. Now, what they can ask you is what was the purpose of the G20 summit? They could ask you case-based questions also. So, if you look at it, if you remember the practice paper, we had discussed about how a climate change, uh, there was one case-based question on climate change and how millets, ka, that one question was there, right? Do you remember that one millet wala question? I'm not able to remember the question name properly. But it was a climate change association or something and uh, they spoke about how millets have to be grown for more period of time. It is there in practice paper 1 for SST. That right here is a very good example of the G20 summit based question. So, with this everybody, we come to the end of today's class, right? So, quickly, here are a few... I would say few MCQ based questions that I have given it to you here. You can take a screenshot of this, right? Take a screenshot and these are some of the PYQs from 2019, 2020 and 21. So all of you, these are some very generic questions and I will give you this question number eight as a homework which you can let me know in the comments of this video right so this is going to be very important for us so quickly to have a look today we learned about globalization we learned about dimensions of globalization role of mncs what are foreign investments we learned about what are the factors that enable globalization where we learned about technology world trade organization and how liberalization helps us so, of course, I hope that all of you found this class helpful. I have, of course, quick reminder that there is a Google form test for all of you where you can quickly check your knowledge of what you have studied. It's just five questions. You need to fill up the Google form and you will get to know how we are feeling confident, right? So, thank you so much, everyone. Now that your date sheets are out, we are going to get very aggressive with your board examination prep. I know many of you have pre-boards coming in, so don't worry. We have a lot of interesting sessions coming your way. We are planning extensively to do strategy sessions to focus more on PYQs. So as you all know, tomorrow at 7 p.m. I am... No. Is it tomorrow at 7 p.m.? I think, ha, huh, tomorrow at 7 p.m. I have three classes tomorrow, so I'm a little confused. Tomorrow at 7 p.m. we are going to be doing PYQs, right? So we are going to be doing PYQs very, very soon. And next week we will also wind up geography and we will start with geography PYQs as well. So now it is all practice, practice, practice. And if you feel, if you love the way I teach, see there are many teachers, but sometimes we respond to only certain people teaching. So if you love the way we teach, if you enjoy the way we teach, don't forget to hit the like button on the video don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the notification button as well and if you enjoyed this class let me know in the comments as well TK. now Ankit has been bugging me for a very long time about what is my favorite anime now I don't want to spur any con I mean I don't mind actually but I watch One Piece right now I've just started watching One Piece and I've caught up to One Piece so yeah off late I think of all the anime that I watched I love One Piece I enjoy it it's, it's very fulfilling right so Ankit, I hope now you are happy you spammed so much in the chat, right? I know in my class I see so many Monkey D. Luffy's, so many uh, Team 7 people from Naruto, so many of you, I knew that you are all love. But I don't, uh, you know, openly admit it because if I start you will get distracted and maybe that's for a day when we have an Ask Me Anything where we can talk about anything and everything. Awesome all of you, all the very best for your pre-boards and uh, periodic tests that are happening. Um, Take care, all of you rest well, please don't, I know now is a very stressful time for all of you where you feel like ma'am, everything is, you know, getting out of our hands and nothing is in our control. But let me tell all of you that we are here by your side and I know this is going to be one of the biggest mammoth challenge that you are seeing in your life for the first time and it might feel very overwhelming. Anytime you feel overwhelmed, if you feel ki ma'am, we just need some positive words of affirmation, come to us, reach out to us, we are here for you, right? Because you are not just any students on YouTube for us, you are like our own children. That is why we make it a point that we show up no matter what, right? And I mean it when I say that. 
Okay. So all of you, take care. Lots of love to all of you. I will see you all soon. But up until then, take care. Good night and keep on learning with Baijus. Good night, everybody.